Hello and welcome to Tech Support, the NWA Tech Summit podcast. You may already know that Tech Support is a great place to catch some of your favorite sessions from the 2020 Northwest Arkansas Tech Summit. This year, 2021, we are thrilled to be adding new and original content that features leading voices from our region's tech and entrepreneurial ecosystem. Today, we are thrilled to welcome two guests, Megan Bowman, founder and CEO of Stonehenge Technology Labs, and Will Brown, who's a lead product architect there. Welcome, Megan and Will. Uh, to get started, I would love to give our audience a chance to get to know you both. Megan, would you mind kicking us off and, and maybe just walk us through the trajectory that led you to launching and scaling Stonehenge? Sure. Um, thank you for having us, Ashley and Graham. We really, uh, we're huge Bentonville fans. It's, it's funny, I actually moved here six years ago, um, uh, kind of on a whim from Seattle when uh, it was announced that uh, Walmart was going to buy Jet. Um, I'd been part of the Quincy integration, um, not like a name drop, like total code monkey contractor, like, you know, peanut butter sandwich worker. Um, they brought in a bunch of people to help push uh, Quincy code into Amazon's giant structure. That's when they did soap.com and, you know, kind of, kind of very, very niche um, groups. And what we learned or what I learned was that uh, Mark Laurie had a really good sense of a CPG driven uh, approach to e-commerce. Uh, so we were basically taking pretty eloquent code uh, specific to chips, trash bags, and toothpaste and shoving it into like a giant book, you know, machine. And so I stuck that in the back of my head, um, you know, years later when it was announced, or I think we heard from a family friend that it was looking like uh, McMillan was going to buy Mark Lore. My husband looked at me, no, no lie, in Seattle and he goes, we need to get, get to Bentonville right now. And we packed up our stuff and moved to our site unseen um, and with the intention of building uh, what is today Stopwatch. So um, that's how we're here. We've been working on it for a while. And, um, you know, Will, uh, we, meaning Will's been building it. He's the real builder. But in terms of the concept, we've been working on it for a while. That's so cool. And I know, you know, we're delighted to have you and Will. Can you give the audience a, a concept of how big the team is and, and what that scaling process has looked like um, from a founder's perspective? Yeah, I mean, um, as, as you ebb and flow, right? Um, when you're bootstrapping, um, sometimes you have more people and sometimes you have smaller people. I think one of the, um, not like physical people, but, um, you know, more people and less people. Um, I would say that the, the most important thing, and, and Will can really speak to this, is um, he's been leading the project um, from day one. And so in terms of the continuity, uh, we have about uh, eight people today. We've had as many as 20 um, and as few as I think four. Um, the core team, depending on you know, where, where we're at on funding and revenue management and uh, et cetera, um, but uh, Will Brown, Zach Fuller and James Sampson and I have, have been through hell and high water uh, together, <laughs> including my living room. So um, <laughs> as big as 20, as small as four, today we're at eight um, growing very, very steadily. So excited to be here. Oh man, we are excited to have you. And you know, you mentioned Stopwatch. We are going to talk a little bit more about what that is later on in the podcast. Um, certainly want to give you space to do that. What else is ahead for 2021 and Stonehenge that you're really excited about? Um, I, I Will's getting to um, he'll talk a little bit more about it, but there's uh, you know, the pain of getting data clean, ready, and right is mm -hmm. is half the battle. Um, we talk a lot about machine learning and, you know, autonomous actions and all that sort of stuff. There is so much work that goes into getting something ready to be um, actionable. And I, you know, we talk about this at, at the University of Arkansas quite a bit that, you know, when you're in the data science program there, you're handed a sterile set of data to then start modeling and doing work off of. That's awesome. Um, however, you know, nine times out of 10 with the data that you get is, really, really bad. Um, and so this data engineering part of the building of Stopwatch actually took two years longer than we thought. Um, and so what I'm excited about is um, the work that Will and the team have done foundationally that just has been a slog, um, a beautiful, long, complicated slog, um, <laughs> now allows us to have really clean data. And uh, one of our former developers used to say, slow is smooth, smooth is fast. And uh, we're kind of in that uh, smooth as fast kind of kind of model, but we were in uh, we were in slow for a long time. So uh, excited to see what Will and the team are, are about ready to, to launch. 
Oh man, that's that's wonderful to hear. And and certainly, you know, those insights are invaluable. Will, we keep talking about you. I want to turn it over to you. Can you tell us a little bit about, you know, just share a top line of your career overview and, and how you came to join Megan and her team? Sure. Thank you so much, Ashley. And uh, thank you both for having us on today. We're very excited about it. Um, yeah, so to talk a little bit about my trajectory, uh, thank you for the intro yet again. Uh, so I, I come from a computer science background. So I graduated with a computer science degree from Henderson State University it's down here in Southwest Arkansas in Arkadelphia uh, in uh, December, 2013. Uh, from there, moved straight up to Bentonville for my first job out of college at uh, Atlas Technology Group, uh, which was uh, uh, huge in terms of development for me. Uh, I was given a lot of responsibility coming out of a college for, for better or worse, um, and absolutely learned a lot uh, in the process of that and had some great mentorship to, to thank uh, during that time as well. So I really kind of cut my teeth on, you know, retail technology and that, you know, enterprise software and that kind of thing uh, and, and took a liking to it and, and really just uh, to put it in a nutshell, how much, uh, you know, change you can affect on some really large problems, um, uh, you know, just from, from, from being in the right spot and, and thinking about things, you know, really carefully. Uh, so I was there for uh, over two years uh, again, had a, a great time there. Uh, from there, actually uh, had a little bit of a turn, went to do my own startup with a friend of mine uh, called Lonley. To put it in a nutshell, it's kind of Uber for lawn care, if you will. Um, so one of my buddies, uh, Andrew Motter, uh, hi, Andrew, uh, did all of the uh, business development on that. And I took the tech side. So that was kind of my first foray into kind of lone wolf uh, software engineering work in a remote setting uh, and learned a whole lot about, you know, what's important for a solo developer and, you know, how to communicate with a business, how to prioritize things and, and, you know, getting into remote work is, uh, was huge, um, especially from where we went from there. Um, so Lonely went on for, for a couple of years uh, as I was working on that actually, uh, made a turn and went back to retail or uh, yeah, enterprise retail software um, in a project called Canopy um, and works on more of an e-commerce focus. Again, was kind of uh, gravitated back toward more of a retail technology slant and, and kind of uh, expanding our capabilities there. That was actually kind of uh, related to Atlas. So I wanted to mention that one as well. And from there uh, was kind of fully, uh, well, I'll say realize kind of the, the role that works best for me, mm -hmm. uh, going forward. And that leads me to Stonehenge and, and, uh, and where we are today and how excited I am about, uh, kind of the role that I'm in and the work that we've been doing, uh, is huge. So I've been remote with Stonehenge from the start, um, kind of taken what I've, uh, learned over the last several years, um, it really felt like the right move for me and my wife in terms of uh, the life we wanted to live and, and kind of uh, the uh, uh, how I feel like I provide the most value in terms of my work output. Uh, moving to remote seemed like a, a really interesting uh, uh, way to maximize that, so to speak. Um, so that's kind of my trajectory. Like I say, I'm, I'm remote with Stonehenge now. And so I've got a lot of opinions about how that goes and, and everything, which I'm sure we'll get to. Uh, but yeah, it's been a fun ride and uh, happy to dive more into it. Well, and I, I just want to be clear that when, when Will says remote, he was in a tiny trailer, like across the country. <laughs> so we're not just talking like, you yeah. know, like he just worked from his home, you know, his 4,000 square foot home in Rogers. He like he was in like a tiny house across the country. So we met, we were like, dude, as long as you have Wi-Fi and you hit your deliverables, we're good. Um, but uh, I, I don't want to sell him short. Like you were you were you were you were cruising. It was like every man's yep. dream. <laughs> yeah, uh, we had a, a 26 foot uh, travel trailer camper um, sold our house in, in Bentonville at the time. Uh, the idea was we were, we were going to go be uh, back in Southwest Arkansas with family. And then we'd be able to kind of move back and forth, come up and see the team in Northwest Arkansas, move back down there to, 
to see family. And so we did that for, for over a year, lived out of the, the trailer. So that was another fun aspect for sure. Life on the road. Uh-huh. Nice. Well, we, we appreciate both of you joining us, specifically Will, because we've been really trying to develop our audience in the Caddo Valley. <laughs> you, you Lot, being, lots of room to grow. <laughs> lots, lots of room to grow. Um, no, for real though, we're going to dig into like sands through the hourglass. What, are, what, is, what is the day in the life of a software developer at uh, Stonehenge look like? Um, so, so talk to us a little bit of, about that. I mean, um, you know, what kind of, what are you responsible for? What are you owning and how are you, you know, kind of chopping away at building stopwatch? Sure. Um, yeah, I'll dive in there and say kind of a, a typical day, uh, you know, obviously it does vary a little bit with uh, us having a very small team, having to wear a lot of hats uh, you know, ebbs of flows of client requests, all of that kind of stuff. Things, things do tend to kind of shift around a bit, <clears throat> but if I could generalize it a little bit, I would say most, most mornings start with kind of, uh, reviewing any of our, you know, scheduled processes, any data imports, ETL type stuff, um, and triaging anything that, that, uh, you know, we need to do operationally. Beyond that, it's going to look mostly like syncing up with my uh, my buddy James, the project manager. We mentioned earlier, uh, shout out James, uh, to prioritize and begin any kind of development work. And that really could look for anything from uh, UI UX work, uh, you know, taking a, a, a customer request for a feature and, and fleshing out what that could look like, you know, all the way full stack down to uh developing you know sql queries and reporting views and power bi outputs it could be could be anything from that point so uh yeah it depends the, I'll, I'll, go the ahead way, the way you know the way the way a small like big big teams are one thing small teams are another we've got this road map right and and on a road you've got two ditches and so, you know, uh, the way I think about it is, look, James, you keep us between the ditches. Like, you know, this is our, this is our IP, this is our model, this is where we're going. Um, and, then, and then the guys really prioritize and move things around. I mean, they're all senior level, um, you know, would be, you know, VPs in big companies. And so they've got the maturity to kind of pick and choose what they're gonna hit when, where, how, and why. Um, it'll be interesting as we scale to see how, um, you know, uh, the the kind of more junior work rolls up um, because um, I'm curious, well, how, how is that going to work? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm as always, it's going to be a, a growing process and, you know, it's a, it's somewhere we've been before on, on some teams that I've been on. So, uh, you know, it's always a little bit unique to the team and making sure that, you know, everybody's, you know, doing their part and getting, getting together and, and contributing to shared pool of knowledge, if you want to put it that way. Um, so yeah, I think there, there's a lot to figure out there. Um, and, and we'll be, uh, learning a lot about it over the next couple of weeks to say the least. So, so, so as, uh, you know, it, it's a, it's an interesting makeup for a company, right? But not atypical these days. In fact, more now more than ever, right? Would have distri a distributed workforce, no matter the company, even a chamber of commerce of all things, right? So, you know, how do you, what, is the, what does the team look like, size of the team? But then, you know, if, if there is a specific culture that's important to you, how do you facilitate, nurture, and safeguard the, the company culture? I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. I think Will and I are pretty yin and yang, which is, I think, one of the reasons we get along so well. Um, a little bit brother sister. Um, so I'll, 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 I'll preface it by saying, uh, when you know, when Will and I started figuring out kind of his style, and he was like, "Okay, I'm, I'm just not going to be here a lot." I'm like, "I'm a hugger. Like, like I'm, I'm <laughs> as close as you get. Like, I am a every person come through the front door and we hug for a minute before you start your work. Like, like you can't get a more opposite." And so, you know, I, I mean, just transparently, I was like, "Dude, to have like our top guy." 
not be in the office. Like I trust you enough to know that it's the right thing. I've never led a software development team. Uh, you are a really gifted software developer. So I'm going to like, but I remember, Will, I was like, but you have to give me some grace. Like sometimes I'm just going to call you just to chat, you know, like your mom, uh, you know, just like all that, like kind of annoying stuff. So I think in terms of how we organized it um, early on to bring in your top, you know, your top leader, um, and, and him have a hard stance on, on his work style uh, really took a, a, a minute for me as the owner to look at myself and say, okay, like you can't have it both ways. You can't have really, really unique talent um, and, you know, micromanage every aspect of it. So I would say, you know, Will, some days I did it well, some days I did it bad. I think the rule was if Will was like within 10 miles of the office, like I could come hug him. It was like a lot of <laughs> definitely a, a push pull kind of thing. Um, but overall, like, I mean, you know, once once people start delivering and, and thriving, um, it, it just gets really fun. And so uh, I would say if anything, it was a it was a huge change for me. And, and I called Will one day and said, um, you know, hey, like, you know, I'm kind of the queen of forced fun. So like, you know, how do we do this? Um, especially once the whole team went remote. Um, and, and Will's like, well, we'll play Minecraft every Tuesday and Thursday for an hour. And I'm like, oh, great. That sounds awesome. Um, <laughs> but like they were, they like loved it. And I learned how to play Minecraft. So uh, those are two kind of weird examples. Yeah, I mean, it's an extremely kind of uh, as you guys say, very important and extremely tricky to get right in terms of like, you know, guarding your corporate culture and, and making sure that that's uh, maintained in a, especially in a remote kind of setting. I think Megan hit it on the head. That, like the most key thing about that is trust between, you know, the remote workers and, and, and the leadership. Um, and really if I could, I'll dive in a little bit more specifically there in terms of kind of what I do, uh, in turn, like from a recruiting perspective, or so, uh, this is more the team at large, something that we do as we're recruiting. But uh, for me, it's very important to kind of understand where each candidate is coming from with regard to like remote work and in, in startups, very especially. Mm -hmm. um, you know, is this person looking for more like mentorship and stability, or do they work better lone wolf? Um, like knowing where your company is in terms of uh, what you can provide and what the candidates are looking for, I think is one of the most important things in establishing that trust or figuring out if there can be that trust early on in the process. Um, and, and that's really the, the first step uh, as I think about it, um, you know, making sure that everybody has ex the same expectations in terms of, you know, uh, uh, how much mentorship you're given versus what is going to be expected of you. So That's yeah, we, we, we're, we're not, we're not super good handholders here at Stonehenge. Um, but, you know, we, we learned early on uh, to like, we've got three principles. Like we don't, we don't have a lot of principles. Our three principles are empower unique talent. And by unique talent, we mean like the weirder, the better. Um, and, uh, typically, you know, the really, really great, especially in development talent is, you know, it'll, it's a Google and Facebook and all those guys. And so, you know, um, to be competitive in the tech talent market, like you got to really go for, um, some unique characters. And so we're super picky. Um, uh, we've been together for a long time, which is a blessing. Um, but at the same time, uh, you know, so, so we spend a lot of time figuring out that unique talent. And when people are unique, sometimes they might work overnight. Sometimes they make, might only type with their left hand. Sometimes they, you know, might need to travel across the country. There's just a million different kind of unique talent kind of opportunities. Uh, number two is operate as a world-class team. So, you know, you get a bunch of, um, you know, I guess LeBron did it down in Miami, you get three superstars and, you know, that doesn't always work, right? Like you have to have that gray matter that keeps the team together. Um, and so it gets really awkward when you've got really unique work styles and then you have to operate as a world-class team. And by world-class team, I, I tell the guys, it's like, it's like Navy SEAL style. Like, I'm not talking like cute little team, you know, rah, rah, rah. I'm talking like when Will finishes a sentence, everybody knows exactly what he said. Or, you know, if James leaves his seat, like we're covering for him, like um, just kind of that living and breathing 
uh, world-class team mentality. And then the last one is when you've got, when you've finally done all the work to get random unique talent together, um, you haven't killed each other. And then you're, you know, operating as a world-class team. Like we better damn well be solving really hard problems uh, really fast and with and, and with really elegant, simple solutions. And so it's kind of this charge of like, okay, let's let's get the island of misfit toys together. Let's figure out how we all work together. Um, and I'm the, the queen of, you know, they're they're very gracious to me. And then you know, once we've kind of earned that right, um, we better go do something really big. Um, because that's too much work and too much kind of risk to to kind of put together that bomb and then to not have it do anything. So uh, again, uh, Will Will leads leads the leads the crew in a, in a phenomenal way. Well, I really uh, appreciate that analogy. You know, the some of the some of the I, the greatest teams. You know, you, you still have to win the game, and, and so many times I think my I'm a you reference Miami Heat. I'm a Portland Trailblazers fan. They put together this amazing All Star team of just star after star after star after star and ran up against an LA Lakers team that, yeah, they had Kobe Bryant and Shaquille O'Neal, but the people that hit the game winning shots were like Derek Fisher from UALR, you know, like it, it, it was, you have to have the, you have to have, yeah, I think you called it gray matter, but yep. you, you have to have those, the, the glue and you know, the, the people that can just get it done. And I want to talk about what's getting done and, and you know, the, the big bomb products that you're working on. But, but before, I really am curious from Will, I get the feeling, you know, you've worked at large companies. Atlas is a pretty big company. You, you know, were a part of um, a very small startup. The feeling you know, you, you could work wherever you wanted to work. And I'm curious what draws you to Stonehenge. You know, m maybe it's what draws you to Stonehenge specifically, but what draws you to a company this size? A great question. And I think there's, there's been some kind of uh, undertones through, through some of my other answers and topics. So I'm glad you asked that uh, uh, very explicitly there. Um, for me, it, the most important thing I think for me, uh, is I work best as, uh, what I think a lot of people call an individual contributor. Um, that's not to say I haven't done anything other than that. Uh, I threw out a lot of my roles. I've found that, that I am most valuable as an individual contributor. Um, and well, let me also say most valuable and most mentally healthy. <laughs> we'll put it that way. Uh, cause there's, there's been some times in the past where, uh, you know, I have been in more of a project manager type position, more of a client services type position where I'm the point guy, uh, doing, you know, customer support triage all the way back to, you know, leading the team, uh, in that way. Um, and I ultimately found that that was just way too much for me. Um, my persona, my, you know, my work ethic, everything kind of, uh, I'm able to focus a lot better and, and, uh, more consistently in, in a more individual contributor sort of role. Um, all of that to say, uh, Stonehenge really has enabled that for me, uh, in a huge way. And I think, uh, has really, allowed me to find that out. Um, and so, yeah, uh, sorry, I kind of forgot where I was headed with that, but yeah. Um, hmm. Yeah. Why, why you could work anywhere, man. Like why choose? Yeah. To right. So, uh, yeah, to go back to kind of the, the setup again, uh, I have to kind of put Megan at the, uh, at the start and say, uh, Megan has allowed, uh, allowed me to kind of figure that out, uh, and kind of drive towards, uh, you know, a work, uh, life balance that really makes sense for me. Um, and being able to do that is not something that you really get just anywhere. 
um, having that level of trust and being able to make very high level decisions, uh, in a, you know, on a, a great team like this and have everyone trust you is, uh, is not something you get from, from just any group or any team or, or, you know, really any kind of company larger than, uh, uh, you know, something where someone can uh, see you from the top down, so to speak. Um, I, I really appreciate you, you sharing that insight. I mean, I think that <clears throat> that doesn't get, it doesn't get spoken in that way enough. We talk a lot in Northwest Arkansas about quality of life, right? And mm -hmm. I certainly believe that if you, if you want a world-class team and you want to build excellent product, you have to have a, you have to have teammates that are um, mentally and emotionally healthy and happy, right? But it doesn't, and so that quality of life, you can think you know what it is. And, and in Northwest Arkansas, we talk about art, cycling, you know, music, food, aviation, all these great things. But at the end of the day, you have to have leaders that trust a team and a team that feels empowered to find their sweet spot, their quality of life, even if it hours away, a thousand miles away, sailing around the world, whatever it is, you know, it's a, uh, that's, that's probably one of the lessons that we don't talk enough about in this neck of the woods is empowering the team to be themselves and respecting when um, they recognize it might not align with what you do, what you think the high quality of life is. All right, that's fine. I trust you go find yours. Yeah. Really Good. Yeah, I, I think I think too. Like um, in building software, I mean, you know, um, just to call out, I, I think it, it, I always like to contextualize things and say um, we are we went underground and built the software um, before we had a bunch of like it, we're a demand driven platform in the in that we started kind of building within the one stone system uh, after you know I, I exited that and, and Bill Waitsman took it over um, so we've been building with you know with the opportunity of connecting with users but it was through a very safe environment and so what I you know what I tell the guys is we kind of took a year um, put pushed all our chips on the table from a financial perspective and said, hey guys, we're not gonna pile on a bunch of clients. Um, we're actually gonna build this thing that we're not really sure if at the end of the, when we come out with this amazing Ferrari, if they're if they're gonna like it. Now, that I say that, I mean, it, it, at the end of the day, we just took a huge risk to say, listen, we're gonna build this big, fast and wide. And when we hit the market, we want our first client to be General Mills. Um, and we want to be able to service them at a top level, you know, as our first client. So when we launched officially in January of 2020, um, and our first signature was a huge contract with General Mills in, you know, July of 2020, um, that's because, you know, of the way that we chose to take the bet. And, you know, so, you know, guys like Will could really dig down and build something big without the distractions of, of, of me and, <laughs> and uh, clients and, you know, so we're grateful for early investors. We're grateful for the team for, you know, working for peanuts and equity. And um, it was just a little bit of a dream team in terms of uh, we got we got really lucky, um, but uh, I don't know. Well, I think, I think that's a big piece of it too. We had space to build, um, not a lot, not as much as we probably wanted, but um, that, that, that enables that exploration. Yeah, that's definitely a big part of it is, you know, having some green field to be able to, um, you know, uh, go chase down and, uh, or attempt some of those ideas, see what works and, and, uh, keep moving. Megan, you hit on some, you know, you said at the beginning of this, you guys packed up and moved here immediately, um, because you recognized that Mark Laurie was, was going to be hired by Walmart, you know, and, um, and that's certainly the number one client in Northwest Arkansas and the world, right? right. But um, I think it's important to point out that the number one client to you was one of the other Fortune 500 companies. 400 of them have, have a location in Northwest Arkansas. Um, but you also recognize that your entire team's not client facing. 
So they don't all have to be here. You know, we want to, and Chamber Guy wants as many of them here as possible, trust me. <laughs> but at the end of the day, we want, we want um, like global leaders and building businesses and industry leading products and companies being built here. Yeah, I think I think when when my husband and I, you know, made the made the choice, um, it was it was it was a couple factors. Number one was cost of living. Like if you're gonna push all your life savings in and like build something for a year without any revenue, like you don't want to live in downtown Seattle, which is where we live. Um, uh, secondly, from a tech talent perspective, and we are you know definitely part of the the fast moving ecosystem in Seattle. Um, is um, there's there's just startups and breakdowns all the time. I mean, there's just constant poaching and moving, and it's it's hard to get momentum um, in a Silicon Valley or in a Seattle um, where there's kind of just a lot of uh, bigger, better, faster, especially in the the high tech startups. So um, so we said let's let's move to Northwest Arkansas, stretch our dollars, be around those 1200, you know, CPG companies that are ultimately going to be using the product. Hopefully they'll take us in well enough to, you know, try something over the fence as a neighbor. Um, uh, but people always kind of give me, give us a hard time that we, we actually don't work for Walmart or with Walmart. We came here to be with all of the vendors, um, and be within arm's distance of them. Uh, obviously we are huge fans of Walmart. Um, but it, it, it has been a really, really interesting thing. And as we, as we've grown and as we continue to recruit, um, you know, I, we look for Midwest talent hands down, mostly in the developer space because of a .NET framework. So like I've had people work for me that used to be in Google and they're so front facing, um, kind of in terms of the way the software works, iOS or, you know, very consumer based applications. Um, that when you get them in front of a very kind of like a uh, classic framework, you know, pallets and G tins and supply chain and kind of the fundamental stuff, um, it, it's hard for them to kind of come back down into that. And so I would argue that, you know, from the developer talent, um, especially the guys coming out of U of A and um, Mizzou and, you know, Central Missouri are really great developers with really good fundamentals, right? Um, and once you have a really good fundamental base, you patch them up with a guy like Will, who I would argue is a really phenomenal leader and a really phenomenal in, uh, individual contributor. And the two are not mutually exclusive. Like, um, he, it's crazy. Really great software developer leaders typically have an aura about them that people just follow. And software developers don't like to sit in big meetings and, you know, sit around a table and, you know, draw on boards and that sort of thing. And so the best software developers that I know are actually really good in individual contributors with kind of a long line of, of um, protégés behind them. And so you take, you know, base fundamentals from, you know, the Midwest in terms of how they're learning to program, put them with a guy like Will and like, you've got lightning in a bottle. So we're, we're really blessed to have kind of that mix of Midwest plus, you know, global talent. It's, yeah, I love this. Um, I have a, one of my best friends who um, left to work for a really large technology company because he got to work on some of the most important tech out there, right? But I would have loved to have had this conversation three years ago and been like, that's great. You get to work on some of the most important techs out there that someone else built. You know, when you could be here building something yourself yep. and turning it into the most important tech, you know? And I also love that you recognize the developer talent um, that the area brings to the table, but then also not to sound super old school, but that like, heartland agri work ethic, you know, that is, you know, maybe it's not the hustle that you think of, but it is this calculated bang, bang, we're going to get stuff done. We're going to plow fields. Yep, exactly. We're going we're to get this done. And I, I think there is a really unique workforce that is almost um, a, a hidden workforce if you could put the right skill sets in their hand and you see people, you see that the, the university and others are really working to do that. And, and I think Stonehenge is, is probably uh, uh, 
building a, a momentum of proof, you know. Yeah, when you got when you got guys like Will um, or James or Zach who could you know work anywhere on the coast if they want to, and they choose to be here, it's um, you know it, it's really fun. Um, we're, we're lucky. So before Will asks for more money at the end of this, <laughs> the answer is yes. It's always yes. Actually, I should come to him first and say, Will, you should get more. Like hopefully that's we're doing that. We'll right. Take it offline. Don't worry. <laughs> I know like he's he's already humble bragging with those guitars hanging up in the back <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> um, so we've talked a lot about people we've talked about the process some um, we haven't talked a whole lot about the product is that can you tell our tell our listeners across the ravine of the Caddo Valley what the product is sure absolutely um, so uh product we'll talk about today is uh stopwatch which is our main thing uh at stonehenge technology labs uh to put it in a sentence uh what stopwatch does is provides uh, a standardized system for doing data acquisition etl normalization and reporting on all that data uh within a cloud provider environment and making that kind of a, a repeatable, uh, customizable process uh, for folks in the retail technology industry and beyond. Um, uh, really, that's just trying to, uh, you know, make sure that we're understanding the right abstractions for uh, big data problem sets today and make sure that we're uh, taking the most efficient and scalable solutions when we do those. So excited to talk about uh, stopwatch and, and, you know, uh, as technical as we like, or as uh, surface level as we like. So, uh, happy to let you guys guide it from there. I, I think a little bit of both would, would be nice. We'd probably have about 10 minutes or so that we can get into this. So, um, I think, uh, I think at the technical level, if you can do that would be pretty fascinating. Okay, sure. So, I'll really quickly say from, from a front end perspective, kind of what this does and kind of some of the use cases involved. So you kind of know uh, what we're talking about here, but then I'll quickly dive into the, the nuts and bolts of what's happening. Um, so at a surface level uh, in stopwatch, what a user of stopwatch might expect to see um, if they signed up for our product uh, uh, would be kind of a, you know, one-stop, uh, reporting layer for any of uh, any of your retail uh, data online or uh, brick and mortar. Um, so what that that starts with a kind of product catalog piece. So getting the the sense of your world together, um, and then really quickly goes into uh, reporting based on that catalog. So uh, once we have defined your source of truth. Uh, our goal is to provide as many kind of uh, uh, across the board linked data points as we can, whether uh, you may be selling into, you know, the, the big online retailers, Amazon, Walmart, uh, you know, go on down the list, Target, uh, Ulta, depending on your uh, categories, et cetera. Uh, getting all that data into a format that makes sense and you can actually derive insights from it uh, is a very, very hard, very, very uh, complicated process. Uh, however, a, a lot of that process does get repeated in you know, companies uh, that are trying to solve these problems uh, here and there. So a big part of what we're trying to do is find the abstractions in all of those solutions uh, and, and you know, see, see how they compare, see what is the best way to do these things. How do you build it in such a way that it's customizable and you can you know, hit the gas and go as big as you need to. Um, and so that's really what Stopwatch is, 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 is us trying to uh, uh, solve really uh, a broad set of problems in this industry um, and, and do it in a way that, uh, that we can build on and uh, uh, keeps things moving in the future. So technically uh, I'll pause there really quickly. Any clarifying questions in terms of like what stopwatch is or does before I kind of dive in further and Megan, please feel free to yeah, jump I'll, in. I'll if it, say in kind yeah. of 
just no that's perfect well so here's kind of the premise like ashley graham when you guys log into mint.com you're actually looking at in, an insane amount of data that mint has basically sucked up to the top and said hey consumer you know make decisions right move your money you know, and what's crazy, what I tell, you know, big CPG executives or even small ones is like, it's insane. Like when you're in the world hailing an Uber or, um, you know, picking your songs on your playlist or, uh, you know, managing your own personal finances, you have a lot of tools at your fingertips that actually have a ton of data behind them. And then you like, you know, turn into your work mode and you sit down and you're like literally in front of like a 25 bit processor, you know, with really old tech and, and that, you know, the young for the young workforce, um, like to them, it's a stark difference, right? Those of us that have grown up and just kind of know that, you know, IBM, you know, dot matrix pointers, you know, to all those sorts of things are just kind of the natural evolution. But at the end of the day, stopwatch um, and, and Will's humble about it. I mean, it should feel like you're logging into Uber, right? Like, like the decisions you make in terms of, you know, your Coca-Cola and, you know, you've got a pricing war going on in the Southwest region um, and your inventory is getting sucked all over the place because you got a third party that, you know, bought a bunch on clearance and is throwing it up on Amazon third party. I mean, those are all like very real game time things that are happening, right? And so why can't the executives who are really smart and have worked really hard to get here like make decisions with real information in real time. And so, you know, uh, long story short, um, Stopwatch is not only just to, to gather clean and report on the data, it's actually to empower teams to connect uh, in ways that they've never connected before. So the idea of like um, somebody calling on Amazon, actually, you know, speaking with strategically somebody calling on Walmart to make sure that their promotions don't overlap is not something that we've ever done. I don't think we haven't done it because we're not like a collaborative, you know, mind space. It's because literally our technology, like we couldn't have that conversation. We talk in different weeks. We talk in different pricing models, we talk in different, you know, promotion timelines, like, you know, we think that Amazon's going to find out that we're talking to Walmart, it's your product, like you're selling it into different places. And so I think, you know, as Will talks through the technical aspect of how this works, I like to tell people think about um, just just very simple tech that you're using every day. Um, I, I say Google like ruined everything for programmers because everybody's like, well, Google, Google can do it. There is so much work that goes under that. And so when we talk about, you know, that simple interface and those simple decisions that Will's serving up, um, that's, that's where he'll go into that, the, um, the data abstraction and, and how you actually get to there. Sorry. Awesome. Yeah. No, take it away. Yeah. So to dive into that a little bit and I'll, uh, I'll apologize really quick. I'll be kind of vague on some points of this, just, you know, obviously kind of uh, some secret sauce here and there, some client mm -hmm. infos here and there. So I'll That's keep it high level to start um, and we can dive in from there. So uh, in terms of what, what Stopwatch is doing on the back end, obviously we talked about, uh, you know, having a product catalog, uh, having the source of truth in terms of what a client is looking for. Once we have that baseline, uh, really the, what I have been fo most focused on in probably the last year or more, um, in terms of the product that I've been working on are, are these pieces. So, uh, those are the, the data acquisition piece, the ETL piece, normalization of that and, uh, reporting thereafter. Um, so to talk a little bit about some of the actual mechanisms there, um, our data acquisition piece is pretty much completely bespoke built purpose built for uh, uh, really just general web automation. Um, so that allows us to uh, uh, really just to put it in as simple as I can, get any data that you can access uh, on the web uh, in, in some form or fashion. Now that's not to say anything about, uh, uh, you know, obviously there are a lot of different security models we can authenticate uh, with a lot of different kind of login flows, OAuth flows. So, you know, if there's any APIs that, that we need to, to access that are authenticated, we are, we're able to do all of that. Um, really just any data that you could access through a web browser, we've, we've kind of uh, 
put together a way that we would be able to uh, replicate that and bring that into a reporting flow. And you can obviously see that that opens up a lot of doors if you can uh, make sure that that you know works in a, a, a scalable fashion. You you can uh, really uh, uh, turn that on to a lot of problems. Let's just put it that way. Um, and so that that the value pieces there are uh, things like orchestration, things like retries, things like. Uh, you know, uh, how much did it cost us to get that information? What was your bandwidth? Um, you know, uh, were there any issues? How do you triage that stuff? Uh, where does the output go? So all of that, those kind of concerns, uh, you know, file storage, blob storage, uh, you know, how we version these things, how do we clean them up later? All of that kind of stuff is part of what Stopwatch does and, and, and has a life cycle for this kind of data coming in. And that's really one of the most important and key pieces. Um, and, and again, one that I've spent the most time on in terms of uh, making sure that that, uh, that that piece can can pivot and solve uh, a lot of different problems uh, to keep the rest of it flowing. Uh, so from there, so uh, assume that we've you know, hit an API um, and grabbed a little bit of, of data, what do we do with that? Uh, the next piece is kind of getting that into a, you know, a data warehouse, um, a lot of people will call it. Um, I won't spend as much time on this. I think a lot of people can, uh, the more technical in the audience know a lot of tools probably have, are working with those tools as we speak um, to move their own data around. So uh, uh, to touch on that a little bit, we're, we're very much invested in the Microsoft Azure um, stack. So we, we do use a lot of their uh, ETL features. Um, namely uh, blob storage for, for a lot of our kind of cold storage and, and uh, uh, really just general purpose data uh, archival and warehousing. Um, and then going on from there to use things like uh, data factory, data bricks, a lot of their managed services to really get a lot of uh, uh, value uh, out of the, the work that we put in, um, in terms of uh, scalability. Uh, so, you know, Azure will go as big as we want to basically. Um, so, so having that, uh, is always, uh, uh, huge when you're talking about, you know, fortune 100 and enterprise data. Uh, the last two pieces just really quickly and close that out is the normalization and, and reporting pieces. Uh, once we have those in a good, clean, uh, uh format, uh, we do also utilize Power BI and a lot of the Microsoft stack there as well in terms of uh, uh, putting out reporting. Uh, so very uh, kind of end-to-end -end, uh, Microsoft stack solution there uh, uh, outside of our kind of bespoke data acquisition layer. But um, those are the main pieces. Obviously could go probably an hour on each of those individually. Um, happy to answer any questions, but I think I'm about out of time. So, uh, well, th thanks. Will. you know, fun fact for the listener, blob storage is actually what my mother called my apartment during my gap mm. year. Not really. <laughs> uh, in fact, they didn't have gap years. They called it the year where my parents went, Oh crap. Is he even going to go to college? <laughs> or they called it the you can't live in my house here <laughs> <Bob Storage. laughs> sorry i've been sitting on that for like a solid three four minutes that's a good like one. i have to say so will was talking our audience won't be able to see this because we're audio only of course but you had the biggest smile uh, oh. so incredibly proud while he was talking uh, <laughs> just it was it was really i think it really illustrated you know, kind of what we outlined earlier about the culture that you guys have built on your team. Uh, and I, I just wanted to point that out and celebrate it. I think it's really cool, uh, the dynamic that you, you've you built within Stonehenge. Well, um, they stick with me and uh, I'm like, I just, I'm just, I, I, I tell them every day, like, I just am so, ex like, it's really fun to just get, like, uh, see what everybody's doing and then just kind of get out of the way. Um, they're doing stuff that I, like, I never dreamed I could do. And so it's, it's just really, it, I don't want to liken it to being a mom, but like, they're just, they're killing it. And it's so fun to just get to be part of it and that they don't like roll their eyes every time that I show up. Like it's, um, 
<laughs> they let me hang out every so often. So that's cool. This has been a, a just an awesome episode of Tech Support. We we visited with a bunch of different size businesses, kinds of businesses, you know, support organizations. But this is where I mean, I, I feel like this is the most we've ever kind of felt from this second stage startup, like more of a in the midst of a scale up company. Um, and I think having um, Will, having your perspective, Megan, having your perspective, seeing how you guys work together, uh, I hope that our listener can hear this because you, it really has felt like um, we're kind of the fly on the wall, getting able to see some really cool stuff happening in, in a company that I think a lot of people are going to hear a lot about. So Hopefully. We're, we're, certainly, we're certainly proud of it and, and proud that... Uh, proud that you decided to pack up from that that dreary rainforest of a of a city and <laughs> move, move to Oz, <laughs> re re relocate to the promised land of the Ozarks. Hey, they weren't even like giving out free bikes then. I almost feel like I should be like, hey guys, remember like, <laughs> shout out for the, to the free bike program. That's so killer. Free bikes are coming. <laughs> You know, I want to pick up where, where Graham left off, sort of in the vein of appreciation. Um, Will, thank you so much for making time in your busy day to, to lend your experience and expertise to the conversation. And Megan, I, I just want to thank you. Um, you know, I should add for the audience, in addition to her role as founder and CEO, uh, Megan is a really dedicated volunteer as part of the Northwest Arkansas Tech Summit committee that plans each year's event. Um, and Stonehenge has been a great supporter of the event. Uh, so thank you, thank you, thank you. We're really grateful to have you both with us today and look forward to lots more exciting news to come. It was a great time. Thank you so much, both of you. Thanks so much to Megan and Will for joining us and thank you for listening in today. For more, more conversations like this one, catch future episodes of Tech Support. And I want you to be sure to save the date for the 2021 Northwest Arkansas Tech Summit, October 17th through 20th. You can buy your tickets now at nwatechsummit.com. Thanks so much. <laughs>